Well, good evening. Welcome to the worship of the living God. What you have on your, your bulletin is, a, is going to be a little different from what you, we actually do. Um, my whole family, like a number of families in the congregation, was on a, an inadvertent weight loss plan this last week due to the flu. So we're, we're pull, pulling an audible here, which is why I'm kind of keeping my, keeping my distance. Actually, we're, we're more than 24 hours out, so we're looking forward to being able to potluck 24 hours of being symptom-free. The service is going to be a little bit different. Our preparation for, for worship is from David Brainerd. David Brainerd was a missionary to the Native Americans. Jonathan Edwards took over a lot of his responsibilities after Brainerd passed away. And Brainerd's diary is one of the, one of the documents that a whole number of missionaries, when missionaries really took off in the 19th century, a lot of them read Brainerd's diaries of what it was like to, to be a missionary. And this is what he had to say about hope in this life. So this is somebody who, he knows what he's talking about. He, he had a difficult go of it. But what he has to say, I'm sure, will be just as applicable for you as it was for him. It's our preparation for worship. If you hope for happiness in the world, hope for it from God, not from the world. If you want to be happy in this life, and every single person wants to be happy, If you're looking for it from something in the world, Brainer says, it is going to disappoint you. So you look for it from God. And this God calls us to worship him. This is why the word blessed comes up over and over again. It's a different way of talking about happy. Blessed is the man who trusts in God. So we're here in a way to be happy, to trust in God. Our call to worship comes from Revelation 14.7. We're going to be thinking about the city of God and the the city of humanity this evening. This is about the, the end of the city of man and the realization of the city of God. Fear God, give him glory, because his hour has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the waters. And that's what we're here to do. Let's go before him in silent prayer. Father, as we think this evening about what it is to live amidst the the city of humanity and wait for the city of God, think about what the resurrection has to do with that. We ask that we might keep our eyes fixed firmly upon you, that we might look for satisfaction from you, because each of us does want to be satisfied. Uh, we've got a pretty poor track record, and that's for all of us, of looking for, for satisfaction here and now and not throwing our, ourselves upon you as your son taught us over and over. So we ask, Father, that we might hear anew so we might be happy as we, as we wait to be happy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to stand. We're going to praise God together again. The, the bulletin is, is going to be different from what we're going to be doing it being after Easter, we're going to be singing an Easter hymn, Day of Resurrection, 391 on your Psalter hymnals, but it's already on the screen. Linda, thank you. Even the, even the artwork on there, thank you for, for doing that, Linda. We're going to stand to sing The Strife is O'er, The Battle Done.
And this great God is the one who welcomes you with these words. And may grace be yours. May God's mercy be yours. May his peace rest upon you. And these come from the God who is and the God who was and the God who is to come. And all of God's people said, Amen. As God's greeted us, let's take this opportunity to greet one another. going to be reading for our testimony of faith from our world belongs to God. The denomination put this out, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 years, years ago now. It's not a confession, meaning it's not binding in the same way. It's, it's an articulation of kind of what the confessions say for, for our present day and age. And we're going to be studying Isaiah this evening. And so we're thinking about this new creation, the new city. Let's read together about the, the new creation. Our hope for a new earth is not tied to what humans can do. For we believe that one day every challenge to God's rule and every resistance to his will shall be crushed. Then his kingdom shall come fully and our Lord shall rule forever. With the whole creation, we wait for the purifying fire of judgment for then we will see the Lord face to face. He will heal our hurts and our wars and make the crooked straight. Then we will join in the new song to the Lamb without blemish who made us a kingdom and priests. God will be all in all. Righteousness and peace will flourish. Everything will be made new, and every eye will see at last that our world belongs to God. Alleluia. Come, Lord Jesus. We're going to be singing together. It's number 620 in your hymnals. It's, it's by the sea of crystal. This is one that picks up imagery from Revelation. So we'll be singing three verses of by the sea of crystal. Please be seated. I ask that the children come forward for children in worship, but just ages three through kindergarten, my understanding is those above kindergarten have, have now graduated. That, that's my understanding. All right. 
All right, so we are going to do the open them, shut them again, all right? Okay, so let's going to go right in the circle here. Charlotte, Sophie, so ready? We're going to do open them, shut them. So you follow me, ready? We open them, shut them. Open them, shut them. Give a little clap. Open them, shut them. Open them, shut them. Fold them in your lap. Let's pray. Father, we lift up the, these little children. Delight in them. They are gifts from you. And Father, we're to be responsible with them, training them in your ways. So we pray for, for that time in which they're, they're trained in your ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And go in peace. wasn't thinking about this when we kind of pulled the audible and put the service together a little bit different with a lot of new creation themes, but it certainly works out appropriately that uh, Dave DeVries passed away this afternoon, and um, yeah, I was able to be with uh, the family for, for a little while before heading back for the evening service, but he went incredibly peacefully. He was talking to the family just shortly before. A lot to be thankful. Linda was mentioning the any number of God's faithfulness, and Linda's got such a good eye for seeing God's faithfulness all over the place. Um, we're praying for, for Dave. I'm sure the funeral will be, obviously, sometime later this week as we figure out when would work best for for the family. So we'll be praying for for the DeVries family. And then so Geraldine Vandeveck made the, the transition from the, the apartments to, to Fellowship Village or herself itself. You know, she made the, the transition well. But that's a, that's a big move. Um, that is a big move. So prayers for, for Geraldine with that transition. Other particular requests, praises. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow, Gerald and Jane's granddaughter, Allison, her boyfriend, four-wheeler accident yesterday and lost his life. So prayers for, for Allison and, yeah, for, for his, his whole family. I'm sorry. Wow. Dale. Indeed. Praising God for the, the wonderful rain. We were in the Monday night. Was it elders or was it council when it started first raining? When was that? Council, there was an, an audible happy sigh in the room when it started raining. So I, obviously whatever happens there is under, under wraps, but I, I, I think I haven't abused any confidence of saying there was an audible sigh of, of joy when it was raining. March. Wedding week, it is indeed. Allison and Ross getting married this week. Sure, it's probably just like that, that she was a little girl and now she's getting married. I'm sure on other days it's probably. <laughs> Forward to rejoicing there. All right, let's go together to our God in prayer. Father, all things are in your hands. 
Your son teaches us to, to pray for what we need because you know it even before we need it and still calls us to pray. Theologians over the years have struggled and did, how do you explain that? How do you come to terms with that? But it's all over your word. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility threaded together in, in every story, in every teaching. As C.S. Lewis, Lewis puts it, it seems that there's this sort of feeling that you, you like to be asked, like to be gone to, that you call us to cast our cares upon you. Because you care for what we care for. Well, and Father, you care for the DeVries family, you care for Linda. You have cared for Dave, you've led him, you've shepherded him his whole life. And now, Father, Think about the verse I was able to read with the family, one of Dave's favorites. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, because I'm gentle, I'm humble in heart, and in me you'll find rest for your soul. And Father, that is certainly the case for Dave right now. Father, we pray that the rest of the family would be finding that the rest even in the midst of sorrow, that, that hope even in the midst of grief. We pray that for Mike and Karen. We pray that for, for their kids. Think about those kids growing up right next to their, their grandfather. Think about for myself what a big influence my grandparents were, and I didn't even live right next to them. But Father, that's a, that is a big, big part of life. And that's a gift. But Father, now that, that part of that gift has been taken away, Father, we pray for those kids. And we pray for, for Mike. No matter how old we are, our dad is our dad. But Father, we ask that you would give the family what they need, and the, the wider family as well. And we pray for, for Geraldine as she has moved from the, the apartments to Fellowship Village. Father, that's there's wisdom in that move. It's, it's proper. It will be for her, her benefit. And Father, all of that makes, makes sense, but it's hard. And Father, as she settles in and finds contentment there, we ask that she might humble herself under your mighty hand. Father, how much of that is that's the, the trick to life in so many ways of this is where God has me. I better humble myself in this, trusting in God. Because Father, trying to to fight against you is only leads to discontent. Father, we pray that Geraldine would make good connections there among the people she, she's living by now, no matter how old we are, Father. We're not that different from when we're little kids, and are, are, are they going to like me? And those questions come to the fore in different ways, but Father, we ask you to give Geraldine what she, she stands in need of. And as we think about, Father, young, young people, we think about his ward's granddaughter, Allison, her boyfriend losing his, his life in this accident. Father, some of us here know what it's, it's like to have a sudden death of a, of a young person. And Father, we ask that you would be with those who knew this young man, those who know his parents, the rest of his family, that they might come alongside him, that family in, in different ways to, to be with them, how throughout your word we see your people being with those in grief and simply being there. That's a ministry. Father, we pray for Allison. We give her what she does stand in need of, and Father, right now, Imagine that. That looks very cloudy, very misty. But Father, you know. So be near to her. And we think about your, your sovereignty. We think about, Father, how many questions that raises when we think about an accident like that. We also, Father, think about, as we're going to study in a little while, that can cause us to be patient when things go against us and trusting as well and also thankful when things go well and father regarding your sovereignty we're very thankful for the rain 
It's nice to, to hear it starting to fall, the, the consistency of it, the, the gentleness of it, Father, soaking into the soil. Father, we ask that we would care well for your creation and, Father, asking for what's needed for the land, that's certainly part of it. We think how big of a thing that is throughout your word, the land, the land, the land. The land is yours, and we, in many ways, are your tenants, taking care of what's yours. And we thank you, Father, for, for your provision this last week. We, Father, ask for, for all that's needful for uh, a good harvest. And Father, as we think about your provision, we are thankful for provision for, for Allison with Ross, and Father, provision for Ross with Allison. We think about the wedding week coming up. And we rejoice with, with Dale and with Marge, with Ross and with Allison. Father, in your, your word, your son loved to use weddings and receptions to talk about your delight in your people. Come, welcome it. Come, enter into to the groom's happiness. And Father, that's what receptions are about, entering into the couple's happiness. And you tell us that's what uh, the new creation is, is about. It's entering into your son's happiness, his happiness of finding a bride, which is us. And Father, the picture that Ross and Allison will build together of that, lead and guide them, give them all that they need. Father, we pray for this week ahead. No matter how much preparation we can do to get ready for a wedding, there's always seemingly 16 last-minute plates that, that seem like they need to be spun. But Father, you provide so we, we rejoice with those who do rejoice. And Father, we ask that you would give them what they need. And Father, each of us for this week ahead, it has something different in store for each of us. And it's remarkable to think that you shepherd each of us in and through it. In the green pastures, in the quiet waters, in the troubles as well. You lead and you guide us. You are with us. And we thank you for that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In preparation for hearing God's word, we're going to be singing it's number 555 in your hymnals, Lead On, O King Eternal. Again, we're thinking about the city of God, the city of, of humanity. Lead On, O King Eternal, the three verses. If you would please turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, 11 to 17. Isaiah 54, 11 to 17. I got you here under false pretenses. You thought you were going to get Jeremiah, and then I switched out a different major prophet for you. 
kind of a slider right there. It's what they call that in the business. They, they don't call it anything in the business. Um, Isaiah, chapter 54, 11 to 17. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you to be seated because I want to tell you a little bit about why we're playing this aud- pulling this audible here. O afflicted city, lashed by storms and not comforted, I will build you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with sapphires. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your sons will be taught by the Lord, and great will be your children's peace. In righteousness you'll be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. See, it's I who created the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it's I who have created the destroyer to work havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Keep your Bibles open, but please be seated. As I mentioned, uh, the flu ripped through the the family, so from Wednesday until uh, yesterday, about noonish, kind of either had somebody sick taken care of, or I myself was sick. And I think largely the main responsibility of a preacher is to say, what does God's Word have to say? You say that with unction, with freshness. And since you're God's people, I think you deserve God's, God's best. I wasn't able to pull that in regards to this passage from Jeremiah. So we're dipping back into a study we did in Isaiah in, in Worthington. We worked, the, worked through the entire book. I really cut my teeth on this book. It's one of my favorites. But all that is to say is, considering it's a little bit older sermon, I've reworked some of it, but there might be some outdated terms like information superhighway, thing, things like that, things that are just years and years ago. That's, that's not really the case. But um, I just wanted you to, to know why I pulled an audible. It's because you're God's people, and I want to bring you what, what God has to say. And I wasn't able to do that from Jeremiah this week, so I thought Isaiah would be where we would go as a little break. But I'm enjoying Jeremiah. Let's go to our gather in prayer. Father, I ask that you would give me what I stand in need of to preach your word to to your people. Father, I don't want anything half-baked for for these people. I don't want anything that's merely reheated by any stretch of the imagination. Father, these are your people. You've set me aside to to speak your word to to them, for them to put it into practice. So, Father, I ask that I be able to to do that. If there's anything that would not be of, of help for your people, Father, I ask that you would keep that from entering their minds, their hearts, that which is of help. Father, may their hearts be very good soil, and I pray the same for myself. Father, what I have to... To offer is yours. Father, the word is yours. You're the one who will do what you want with it. It's not going to return to you void. Father, give me what I need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A city, a city is more than a location. I've never been to, to Seattle. Um, I've got a good friend who's got, a couple, who's got some kids in Seattle. But Seattle's not simply 142 square miles on the Pacific coast. All right, just like Inwood isn't merely the, the square mileage here, right? It's, you can't just say that, that that's all that it is. No, it, it's, it, there's, there's a mindset to a city. There's particular people who make up a city. There's a, a Seattle way of life. There, there's an Inwood way of life. 
a city. It's more than a location. It's, it's, it's an identity. And at times throughout the book of Isaiah, what he does is he's throughout it contrasting two different cities. There's the city of humanity, the city of man. Talks about it in any number of different ways. And this city is very attractive. This is the sort of city you would want to move to in their brochure that it would look very, very glossy, very, very attractive. Any number of amenities, this is a place they know how to sell themselves and you want to go there. Isaiah describes the city as the queen of the kingdoms. And the city of this world's appealing, it's glamorous. And the book of Revelation picks up this imagery and it calls it Babylon. And we tend to have a negative view of Babylon, but that's only because God's told us 10,000 times. Because otherwise, Revelation's clear, everybody else loves Babylon. And everybody loves the city of man. Except for those who God's opened their eyes to say, not all that glitters is gold. Because the city ends in destruction. Isaiah calls it the ruined city. The entrance to every house is barred. In the streets, they cry out for wine. All joy turns to gloom. All joyful sounds are banished from the earth. The city is left in ruins. Its gates is battered to pieces. And Babylon's connected with, with Babel, Tower of Babel. It's impressive, but it's doomed. And you live in a culture in which Babylon shoves itself down your throat 10,000 different ways, in which to say, do you really think you've thrown in your, 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 your lot with the people of God? Was this really wise? Look at all that you're giving up. There's all these studies over and over again about people leaving the church and young people leaving the church, and you want to be, well, it's a sense of, well, Babylon's really, really skilled at selling itself. It's not that hard to figure out. You just tell all the benefits, and you keep all the fact that it's going to ruin your life, you keep that to yourself. The city of this world, it's... It's prideful, it's attractive, it's also pompous, and it's going to be destroyed. And if you have a sense of that, you want to say, okay, well, where do I go? Where do I belong? Well, what's, what's my way of life? Who am I? Where do I fit in? Well, you fit in the city of God. And that's beautiful. That city is godly. And that city is secure, and that's the claim of this passage as we work our way through Isaiah. The city of God, it's beautiful. It's godly. And it is secure. And I hope as you think about where would you want to spend eternity, I would hope those would be the three things you'd be looking for. going to be seeing this in three points, not hard to guess. The beautiful city, the godly city, the secure city, if you got your Bible open. Verses 11 to 12, it shows God's city is beautiful. Verse 13 shows that it's godly. And verses 14 to 17, this shows it is secure. First is the beautiful city. Now, the city of this world is very, very attractive. Uh, there, there's a reason people continue to get, to get duped by the world. God's people don't usually look all that impressive. The church doesn't usually look all that impressive. Churches are always trying to do, like, okay, well, re refreshments, cosmetic makeovers. Try we really need to kind of rebrand church because you know, it doesn't really look, seem all that attractive to people. You hear this all the time in different denomination and other church groups that you talk to. Just kind of make yourself winsome. It's, it was the same in Isaiah's day. This is just the way the people of God are in the world. Oh, afflicted city lashed by storms. Trouble is nothing new for the people of God. If you look on the horizon, you see things that might be a little bit scary of what it means to follow Jesus in this culture. Isaiah would say, well, Show me some time when it actually hasn't been all that difficult to follow Jesus among people who want to live life their own way. If your goal is peace in this world, you've chosen the wrong way of life. Jesus is clear, you want to follow me, that there's going to be trials. 
So I give you my peace. And the peace is you're going to wind up in this city. So if, if your goal is to say, I want to be impressive in the present, that, that's, that's not church. Verse 11 is the fact that you live by promise. This is how Isaiah lived because he is thinking about the book of Jeremiah. It happens a good deal after Isaiah. He's thinking about Babylon from a long ways off. He's thinking about all the difficulty when society starts to fall apart, which is what we're studying in Jeremiah. Isaiah is seeing it from a distance. And God's saying, okay, I'm giving you promises beforehand so that when everything starts to go down the toilet bowl, you're going to remember my hope is not tied to this life. Verse 11, O oh, afflicted city slashed by storms and not comforted, that's where you're at now. Here's the promise. I'll build you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with sapphires. I'll make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. So the message here is that God's people, you're not going to beautify yourself. You're not going to make the, the, the church as God's people so attractive that everybody just kind of wants to come in. What he's saying is, I'm the one who's going to make you beautiful. And I'm going to do it in, in my time. The, the church is a Cinderella story. If, I mean, people love Cinderella because it's the sense of somebody who's poor, marginalized, is made into something different. That's, the, that's your story. If you are part of the city, if you're part of God's people, that's your story. And if you expect it's always going to happen in this life or even going to happen in this life, it's most likely not because God says this is, this is a new creation thing. The idea that we're going to conquer all our giants, that we're going to make life the way it really should be in this life, you don't find that in the Bible. What you find is stories like Isaiah's that most likely ends with his life falling apart in pretty difficult ways, but him holding on to God. Or Jeremiah, whose life ends up in a pretty difficult situation, oh, afflicted city. He's just holding on to the fact that, okay, I've got promises. It ends pretty much like, okay, thinking Dave DeVries. Him trusting, saying, God's going to make all things new. That's the only hope I've got. And this is the, the hope that the, these people put their hopes in, the sense of God's going to make them what they should be. The Apostle John, he picks up on this same imagery. Revelation, if you read through Revelation, it's, it's largely almost Isaiah in New Testament terms in many ways. This is why when you go through the city, it's all these precious stones. It's the sense of God's made his people beautiful. And the reason you need to hang on to that is you're not going to be seeming like you're all that beautiful right now. I mean, open your newspapers. By and large, evangelicals don't come out all that well with the way they're viewed. And it's not most likely going to seem any better 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So you're going to need to say, apparently I'm pretty offensive to a whole lot of people simply by doing what God tells me to do. And then you finally picked up the fact that the that's actually where almost Christians across the whole world have always lived. And so you need to remember, okay, God's going to make me beautiful. And that's what's going on with these jewels. It's a sense of splendor, the sense of this is what I'm going to make you into. This is how I see you. How do you think God sees you? It's not a question we tend to ask ourselves a lot. Because we know the Sunday school answer, well, God loves me. But you sit with that for a while and there's a sense of, do you think God actually sees you as precious enough to ordain with jewels? The way I tend to view myself is, God might let me into to heaven through the doggy door if I pretty much do everything that he says. And Jesus over and over again says that that's... You, you, haven't you met my dad? I've been trying to show him to you over and over again. He rejoices over you. He delights in you. Most of us aren't very good at being delighted in. Right? We, we, we're very uncomfortable with it. Well, this passage says, okay, this is what God's going to be doing throughout eternity, so you better get used to being delighted in because God loves to delight in his children. 
He makes him beautiful. But again, he's the one who, who does it. Verse 11, you notice the subject, I will build you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with sapphire. I'll make your battlements with rubies. You see this at different points in church history, but often people want to change this world into to what it should be. This happened in the, the early 21st century, the, cent, the early 20th century. The idea is we should make the city of man into the city of God, and if only the church used its resources to make this world good and great, wouldn't that be amazing? We haven't changed it much at all. In a lot of ways, it winds up being worse than it was. God's saying is, I'm the only one who's going to make it the way it's supposed to. And Zion is the name given to this city. This representation of the people of God. The song we're going to sing after the, the sermon is about Zion, which is about you. So if you ever feel you know what the church is and all that impressive. Yeah, then you got a pretty good read on it. That's largely what churches tend to want nowadays. Um, momentum is really what churches want. They're, they're their church on the go. They're the things where they're happening. Well, I grew up in a place where you got 11 CRCs in every town. What happens is the people wind up kind of going to the churches where everything happens and then everything starts happening somewhere else. What it's about is saying, actually what you're looking for is only going to be happening on the, the other side. That's where the beauty comes. That's where you actually see how God has always seen you. That's where I'm going to see how God's always seen me. Because if you're like me, you're not very good at seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's our first point is God's city is beautiful, and the second is that it's godly. The city of this world is it's pompous. I mean, the arrogance you see in our culture, that, that's, that's nothing new. And the city of God, on the other hand, it's filled with people who want to be like God, God-like or Godly. That's pretty much what Godly is. You want to be like God in all the best ways, all the right ways. That's verse 13. All your sons and daughters will be taught by the Lord, and great will be your children's peace. Now, that's going to be the impulse of everybody you meet in the new creation, is they will want to be taught by God. If you've ever met somebody who all they want is to say, God, tell me what to do and I will do it, that is a delightful person to be spending time with because you know they can be trusted because they put God here and everything else here. And that's everybody that you're going to meet in the new creation. This is Jesus' understanding of this verse. He, he quotes this when he's going back and forth with the Jews. He said to them, nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I'll raise them up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, they'll all be taught by God. What he's saying is, okay, if you've come to me, if you're actually following me, not, not just if you happen to grow up hearing about me and you haven't kicked me to the curb yet, but if your goal in life is to actually say, I'm going to be very uncomfortable by taking this step that he tells me to, and then I'm willing to be very uncomfortable by taking this step that he tells me to, and then I'm willing to be very uncomfortable by taking this step that he tells me to, which is really what following Jesus is, is to say, I'm calling you to follow me. What Jesus is saying is the reason you're doing that is because you're taught by God. Now this morning we had, we had Joanna's baptism, and Nick and Shirley, that they made promises to raise her in God's ways and what you want for Joanna and what you want for every kid that's baptized in this church is to grow up being able to say among these people I was taught by God that's what you're doing if you're teaching Sunday school you're not just sometimes I know it feels like okay I'm just trying to keep these kids contained you're actually doing what Jesus says he was doing you're you're teaching people from God God is working through you I mean, that's why we got children in worship going on right now. This is why we're studying God's Word right now. Because we want to know God. 
and you want the peace that comes with that, that's verse 13, all your sons will be taught by the Lord and great will be your children's peace. When you think about what do you want for your kids, you want financial security for your kids, right? You want opportunities for your kids, right? These, these are fine things to want, but when push comes to shove, what you really want is wholeness. What you really want is peace. I would guess that Isaiah is talking about that this, this shalom view of the way things are supposed to be. And I, my guess is you'd be willing to sacrifice financial security for that. You'd be willing to sacrifice opportunities for them for that. Of man, if I could have my kids know the Lord, want to walk in His ways, growing in wholeness in Him, everything else I'd be willing to get rid of. And so that's, that's what the new creation is about. This is why pastors, theologians throughout the ages are, are quick to say if you really don't like God and godliness and being near God and stepping out of your comfort zone and wanting to become more like God, well, that's, that's, that's what it's all about in heaven. And when you think about that, then you see, man, I'm falling short of that. that. That's how I feel whenever I think about godliness and the new creation. It's the same thing I do when you, read, when you read the Gospels and you see Jesus. What you should see is, man, he is totally different from me. He responds very different from I do. i quick to lose my temper in certain situations. He doesn't do that. I'm quick to fight back. He doesn't do that. And so you see, you need to be different. And this is David Brainerd. We started the service with him. This is what he had to say when he thought about this, this new city and, and winding up there. He says, I long to be perfectly holy so I might never again grieve God, who even though I continue to sin against him, still loves me. And I long for this even more than my own happiness, that I might never again sin against him. So why does he want to go to heaven? So we'll never sin against God again. So he'll never say, man, I have disappointed God again. And if you've got a heart like that, yeah, there's things that you're going to want. There's, there's loved ones you're going to want to see again. There's any number of difficulties you want to leave behind. But if you've got it within you to say, what I really do want is never again to disappoint God who loves me so much more than I can understand, and that would be the best. That's a heart that's godly that wants to be in the godly city. So the city of God, it's godly, it's, it's beautiful. And finally, it's secure, and that's our third and our final point. My guess is that uh, most of us in the Inwood area rarely think about security. When I moved here, kind of came to the terms that I think people might have been offended when I locked my doors when I got out. At a sense, like, what are you saying about Inwood? We, we, it's not safe enough for you to leave your car open? No, we rarely think about security here. There's a number of reasons for that. Got good police officers. There's a generally amicable way of life. Usually everyone kind of knows what's going on anyway, so they would know who's kind of poking around in the cars anyway. But the reason you don't think about security is because you got it. Isaiah's listeners, they thought a great deal about security because they were told over and over again, here's how things are going to start falling apart. And when you start to think about how things are going to fall apart, you think a lot about security. All right, this is why gun sales were so high over the past year. This is why people were thinking so much about financial management over the past year. When things start to look really dicey, you start to think about how can you keep things secure. And verse 14 is saying, okay, what you're looking forward to is the time when you don't even need to think about that stuff at all. That's verse 14, the secure city. In righteousness you'll be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You'll have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It won't come near you. If anybody does attack you, it won't be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. That's not God's way of saying that in the new creation there's going to be people harming you. He's just going to say it's not even possible to really think about it. It's just a hypothetical that can never happen. See, it's I who create the blacksmith who fans the clothes with flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. 
and it's I who have created the destroyer to work havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail. You will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the Lord, their vindication from me. So what this is saying is, okay, God is the only one you're ultimately going to have to reckon with in the new creation, and there's going to be no cause for any trouble, any difficulties. That, that's the security of the city. It's not alarms. It's not police officers. When John takes a look at it, that's why he says the gates of the city never shut. Essentially, what he's saying is you could leave your front door open for 30 years and nobody's going to take anything from you because nobody's got anything in their heart that's messed up. And you won't have anything in your heart that's messed up. And if you know God, right now you have a, a little tiny taste of that security in providence. This is from the Belgian Confession. Thinking about God being in charge of everything, which is really what he's saying it's about in the, in the new heavens, the new earth. He says, don't worry, I've got everything. And what he says in this life is, don't worry, I've got everything here too. But there's going to be a lot of difficulty now. But no, I'm able to use it to, to good. This is the Belgic Confession. This doctrine gives us unspeakable comfort since it teaches us that nothing can happen to us by chance, but only by the arrangement of our graciously heavenly Father who watches over us with care. In this thought we rest, knowing that God holds in check the devils and all our enemies who can't hurt us without his permission. So as you think about, okay, how does this idea of God holding me secure in the new creation help me now? Because you might be thinking, okay, well, when I get there, that's going to be great. But as I look and read the newspapers, it's between then and now that I'm kind of worried about. Well, you've got to remember, well, whatever happens, God here is saying is, I'm also in charge of the havoc. I'm also in charge of all the chaos. That's what God's saying. He's saying, don't think for a second that somehow evil's got the upper hand. And man, God was doing really good in America until a certain day and age. And then he kind of lost it somehow. And now he's just doing his best like a chess player who's really trying to get all the moves and trying to get back on top. He says, no, he's still in charge of everything. And as you read books by people who are actively persecuted, what's, what's paradoxical is it causes them to trust God more, not less. This is Richard Wormbrand. He was tortured for 14 years for his faith, and he said many persecuted believers have thrived in the desert of prison. Perpetua, a third century Christian, was imprisoned and martyred for her faith instead of her prison cell. The dungeon became to me, as it were, a palace. So I preferred there to being anywhere else. And Wormbrand went on to say, I've found jubilant Christians only in the Bible, in the underground church, and in prison. Now, I'm not actively persecuted for my faith, which, which means in my carnal heart, I wonder how much would I be willing to trade to keep peace with the world. And that's one of the debates you see going on in any number of different ways in the culture is what are people willing to cut away to keep peace with the world? Now, what Wormbrand would say to me is, okay, Adam, you, you haven't been through it. If you're in it, what you're going to recognize is what God said in Isaiah is true is that God's in charge of all of that too. He's got purpose for, for that too. You've got to trust him in that too. And that's the only way you're going to find yourself saying, okay, I'm going to wind up in a place that really is secure. Because if your whole goal in life is to make this life secure, what God is saying is, okay, well, what about the next life? That, that's what Jesus, what he's saying is, he says, don't fear those who can harm the body, but can't do anything after that. He's saying, if your whole goal is to make this life exactly the way you want it, you're thinking very short term. You've got to start thinking long-term. Long-term planning is what Jesus is into. He's saying you better start fearing the one who's in charge of everything. That's what Isaiah is saying. Is I'm the one who causes havoc. I'm the one who makes good and evil. I'm the one who does all these things. So in this heavenly city, what he says is if you keep trusting me there, you're going to find that in the end there was nothing to worry about. And that's what's going on with these gates not being shut. That there's no what-ifs in heaven. If you're like me, you're wired to think about what-ifs. 
all the 87 things that could go wrong, and you got to have a contingency plan for that. And then, okay, well, what, if this happens, then, well, then, okay, well, maybe I tick this person off, and then that'll happen. How do I deal with that? God is saying, okay, you never needed to worry about that stuff to begin with, and in heaven you won't at all either. Because it's secure. And so that's where you're heading toward if you trust God and if you trust Jesus. Because here, Isaiah 54, if you got your Bible open, just look one chapter back. It's on the same page. You get Isaiah 52 and 53, which is all about the king. It's all about the king of the city. It's all about how does he make his people beautiful. It's all about how does he make his people godly. It's all about how does he make his people secure. This is how he does it. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we didn't esteem him, but surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. He was crushed for our iniquities, pierced for our transgressions. We all, like sheep, we've gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and goes right into that, into this new city. So how do you get to the new city? The way you don't get it is just by recognizing that the world's a messed up place. The way you don't get it is trying to just avoid being worldly. That, that'll lead you to Phariseeism. The way you do it is saying, okay, I gotta know the king. So the question for you is if you want to enter the city, it's not so much do you want to, but the question is, okay, do you know the king? Is he making you beautiful? Is he making you godly? Do you trust him for security? That, that's, that's what it means to be a pilgrim. Let's go to our God in prayer. And Father, we ask that you would give us what we do stand in need of. Just even as I heard, I'm not sure if that was just a bit of wind, but maybe some rain. Father, we'll take that. Be very thankful for that. But we ask that you give us what we stand in need of throughout this week as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite hymns we're going to sing from Isaiah. I wrote, drove this one into the ground when we studied Isaiah um, in all the best ways. Glorious things of you are spoken. Let's just do verses 1, 2, and 3. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's number 506. 506 in your Grace Altar hymnal. Sorry about that. Jane is also playing without a net this evening. All right, if you've been to the circus, when they do the trapeze without the net, that's when everyone's like, oh. So Jane playing without a net tonight. That's what she's doing. 506. We're going to just do verses 1, 2, and 3, and we're going to save verse 4 for after for the final song. Let's stand to sing. We're, we're changing tunes here. It's in the blue one, correct? Glorious things.
luck after the after the evening service after we have the blessing we're going to sing the final verse of that song and I'll go with the blessing of your God and not him who's able to do far more than all we ask and all more than we imagine according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen